We are at the Estancia La Jolla Hotel and Spa in La Jolla, California. The reason we're here is that just across the street is UC San Diego. I'm with Patricia Churchland, who's Professor Emerita of Philosophy at UC San Diego, and she has a new book out called Brain Trust. Down the street is the Salk Institute. You're also an adjunct fellow there. This is a, a, a seminal book in my view. The title of this one is What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. Why is this such a, a, a crucial time for us to understand how the neuroscience can inform the way we behave? Well, I think that several things have happened in, in science, but also in the larger society that make these issues particularly relevant right now. One thing is that Evolutionary biology is much, much richer than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Additionally, we understand much more about animal behavior, especially that of primates, and the respects in which it's similar to and differs from human behavior. But finally, in terms of the brain itself, we've really begun to understand certain aspects of what makes us social, and that the way it is that humans are social has much in common with the way any mammal is social. And it has to do with our evolutionary origins and the fact that there was a huge change that had to do with making mammals social. So that if you are a, a lizard or a newt or a frog, you lay your eggs, the eggs hatch, but you don't have to take care of the infants. Right. With mammals, that all changed. And what it meant was that the circuitry in the brain organized itself so that the, the, the need to care for oneself expanded to caring for others. And in the first instance, those others were offspring. So I think these insights that came out of understanding mammalian evolution and understanding the way that certain hormones rewire the brain to make caring for and trusting and being with others essential was a critical thing. This is one of the most lovely books I've ever seen. There's an amazing jacket illustration called Brain by Sebastian Kalautsky from Shuttershock. It is um, a lovely thing, yeah, actually, and, and, and I know people job. who have said that they had intended to buy the electronic version and put it on their Kindle or their iPad until they saw, saw the, the physical object. You have on the, uh, the, the before the contents page a couple of quotes. One's from Seneca, it, it's a vice to trust everyone and equally a vice to trust no one but also a very nice one from Ian McEwan, the great novelist from his book Eternal Love. This is our mammalian conflict, what to give to others and what to keep for yourself. Treading that line, keeping others in check and being kept in check by them is what we call morality. You must have put there because you think that's pretty accurate. I think it's a beautiful way of summing up the sort of core of morality and its practical nature. And that is that in a certain sense we really need each other, we function much better and we prosper to a much greater extent if we are part of a group. At the same time that means we are in competition with others in the group. There are things they want from us or demand from us and that we have to somehow navigate our social space without losing our own bearings and without being so obnoxious that we get thrown out of the group. And finding this balance is not a matter of following a particular rule. It's a matter of judgment, experience, understanding, listening to stories, and developing within a certain kind of loving social context. What do you think is the driver for people being so taxed at this moment by mm. these issues of morality? Well, you know, it's always a hazardous thing to try to speculate about the origin of a zeitgeist. And so I can sort of tell you a little bit about what motivated me. And I can speculate a bit about 
why there is this interest in morality, but my speculations may be no better than anybody else's. But my speculation really is that, that we are, we humans are much more interconnected now on a global scale than we have ever been. And that makes us sometimes puzzled about how other people do things, why their conventions are different from ours, and in some very famous kinds of cases, it means that there can be a kind of clash of values where it isn't just a matter of I tolerate you and you tolerate me, but one group may feel that the other's way of life is intolerable. And so we reflect on these things. And I, my sense is that since 9-11, but also since the great increase in interconnectedness globally, that these questions arise for people and they want to understand. At the same time, I think there is a recognition that religious absolutism in the moral domain is likely to be a hindrance rather than a help in this larger project of us getting along together as humans. Um, and, and by that I mean that there can be quite a lot of tolerance with regard to various sorts of social practices that a, a particular religion or some other religion might adopt. But that where, we, where people draw the line is in thinking that only I or only me and my religion have the right answers and all the rest of you are wrong. And I think there's a growing awareness globally that that actually won't work. That you can have your particular rituals in the privacy of your own home, but that on the other hand, you don't get to blow me up because you have a particular religious belief. The critique that you're reducing things just to molecules and what has happened to soul and being and all those good things. I mean, how do you answer that stuff? Well, I think in, in an interesting way, actually, the, the neurobiological approach that sees an important role for oxytocin and vasopressin in bonding and attachment and hence in trust is a kind of affirmation of the reality of social values and, if you like, of moral values. And so whereas some people might be tempted to say that these social values are not real, that they're in some sense illusory, I think this helps us understand how they are real and how morality is a real thing, as real as social life. Why did you write that book? Well, I had always wondered about morality and I always felt very, uh, that is about the origins of morality and I used to talk to, to Crick, to Francis Crick about this and, and he would say, well look, there must be a biological part to the story. Otherwise, it would be hard to explain why the certain kinds of motives are so deep. And we would talk about what that might be and so forth. But it was really only recently that I came to see how the story of attachment and bonding in mammals could really be the key to understanding the nature of sort of social need and sociality in general. And how if you, once you've got that, and then you have a brain that can solve problems, as mammalian brains in general can, but as human brains in particular truly can. And construct social and how, landscapes. Yeah, and how imitation is so powerful in humans. We see it in all primates, but in humans and in certain birds, hugely powerful. And so you could begin to see that out of what might seem like a very humble beginning, came this kind of sociality that produces cooperation and trust and allows people to work together to do these absolutely extraordinary things. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you. The book again, um, which I highly recommend to anybody, is Brain Trust by Pat Churchland. Nice to see you.